wait a couple of minutes for Mr. Fortenberry. We are just finishing up uh, our series of votes for the day. Subcommittee for Agriculture, Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and related agencies will come to order. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's hearing, which is our first uh, in the 116th Congress. Uh, before we get underway, I'd like to personally welcome all the returning members to the subcommittee, uh, as well as our new members. Uh, although. Uh, they have not all arrived. Uh, Ms. Lee of California, Ms. McCollum of Minnesota, Mr. Cuellar of Texas, and of course, Ranking Mem Member Fortenberry of Nebraska, and Mr. Molinar of Michigan. I'd also like to thank Mr. Adderholt for his work on the subcommittee. He served as chairman for the previous six years. I uh, look forward to working with all of the members of the committee in a productive and a bipartisan manner. I also would like to thank uh, Commissioner Gottlieb uh, for allowing us to start the hearing uh, two hours later. <laughs> We're very appreciative for your flexibility. Uh, the work of this subcommittee touches the lives of every citizen on a daily basis. As we've said so often, uh, many don't recognize the far-reaching jurisdictions and programs uh, that this subcommittee addresses. A little bit of everything from food safety to agriculture research to drug approval to rural development to protecting market integrity through the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Part of our efforts include providing necessary resources to the Food and Drug Administration, which plays a critical role in the lives of every single American. In addition, we have a duty to make sure that those resources are put to the best possible use uh, by the agency. With that, I'd like to welcome our witness, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. We're delighted to see you. Uh, today, we would like to discuss the status of operations at the Food and Drug Administration, including the impacts and the recovery from the longest and the most pointless shutdown in U.S. history. Before we begin, I'd like to thank you and your very committed employees uh, for your efforts during the shutdown, many of them working without pay. While the full impacts from the shutdown will not be known for some time, there are undoubtedly accrued backlogs of inspections, delayed drug and medical device reviews, and potentially uh, exhausted pools of user fees as a result of the shutdown. We look forward to hearing the processes put in place to work through these backlogs as efficiently as possible and other efforts to return to more standard operations. Again, I'd like to thank you for being with us today and look forward to today's discussion. I will uh, defer uh, the 
opening statement from our distinguished ranking member, Mr. Fortenberry, until he arrives. Uh, and at this time, I defer the comments from our chairwoman of the full committee, Congresswoman Lowy, who I believe is en route, and she will have some opening remarks. Uh, before Dr. Gottlieb begins, I'd like to give a reminder to members that, as is customary with our subcommittee, members will be recognized by seniority for those who were here when I gaveled the hearing to order, and then in the order of their arrival after that. We will alternate majority and minority members, and we will adhere to the five-minute rule. Commissioner Gottlieb, without objection, your entire written testimony will be included in the record. I recognize you now for your statement, and then we will proceed with questions from members. Uh, thank you, Chairman, Mr. Chairman. And I want to uh, thank the ranking member as well, uh, who I had an opportunity to meet with uh, a couple weeks ago and look forward to his arrival. And I also want to thank the members of the subcommittee. Um, I want to thank all of you today on behalf of the FDA for your continued support of our public health mission. We're witness to, uh, quite simply, a period of historic scientific advance right now, and the opportunities that we have across our entire portfolio to advance health and well-being and protect consumers exceed any comparable period of rapid technological change, in my opinion. And your support is helping us seize those opportunities. The initiatives that Congress supported in our 2019 budget will help us uncover new treatment options for patients suffering from debilitating conditions, improve competition to help lower drug costs and improve patient access to medicines, and advance the development of treatments for rare diseases and secure food safety, among many other initiatives. To complement the support that you've given us and to secure these scientific advances, we're also undertaking one of the most significant policy modernizations at the agency in decades. And I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about some of the elements of this undertaking and how I believe they extend the opportunities and the resources that you've provided with us. These steps begin at the outset of the new drug development process when a sponsor files an IND seeking permission from the FDA to administer an investigational drug or biological product to patients for the first time. Beginning in the next few months, our Center for Drugs will adopt a new standard templates for the review of these protocols. By using standardized templates for the submission and review of these INDs, we believe it will help investigators more efficiently advance new research while making sure that the FDA has the information it needs to safeguard patients. As part of our pursuit of a more standardized methods for the assessment of information across all aspects of our drug review process and to improve the rigor and predictability of these methods, we're also extending these same approaches to how we assess product safety. We're launching a safety signal tracker to serve as a repository for important information and potential safety issues throughout a drug's life cycle, from early in IND development through application review and well into the post-market. This consolidates information about safety concerns during drug development in a single location, and in this way, safety questions can be more consistently tracked and annotated and continuously evaluated through every stage in the life cycle of a new medical product. It'll help cement a more systematic approach to how we continue to evaluate certain safety questions throughout the new drug and biological product application review and could measurably improve the drug development process. This same commitment to using modern tools and policies to achieve a more structured approach to drug development extends into our review of clinical evidence in new drug applications. For the first time in more than 20 years, we're undertaking the first update of our guidance outlining how we assess the clinical effectiveness for drugs. A lot's changed in the last few decades. We have much more opportunity to use a broader array of data as confirmatory evidence to help support new product review. And this includes real-world evidence and real-world data. These same general approaches also extend to our efforts to modernize how we assess post-market drug safety. As part of the new drug regul regulatory program modernization that we've launched, we've put in place a new effort to analyze more safety data more efficiently across the entire drug life cycle, including in the post-market. We're implementing changes to capture more types of safety data, enhance our data analytics, and grow our Sentinel's database's ability to detect potential new safety problems. We'll be working to link claims data in our post-market Sentinel system to electronic health records to improve our ability to conduct active surveillance and use real-world data to improve patient outcomes. And we'll be using the new resources as part of the 2019 budget to help advance these efforts by linking information from electronic health records to the data that we have on medical claims through our existing Sentinel system, 
we'll be able to get a much more complete picture of potential safety issues post-approval and to advance the use of real-world data to study drug effectiveness. As another part of these efforts, I'm pleased to announce that FDA's adverse event reporting system for drugs will be expanded to cover more types of safety data. And for the first time, this system will also include pre-market drug safety data. The support of this committee is key to all these efforts, and it's a key to our goal to help leverage the tools of science and innovation to advance the public health. I look forward to working with you on these shared goals and many other endeavors, and look forward to answering your questions today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gottlieb. We will proceed with questions. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I applaud the efforts of you and your agency's employees during the shutdown, and it's a testament, I think, to their dedication. Uh, they were a bright spot in the pointless shutdown. My question is, where does FDA stand in terms of getting the agency back on track? What kind of backlog accrued uh, for your review work? How long will it take to get it back to normal? What's your assessment of the shutdown's impact on employee morale, on hiring and recruitment issues? I'm very concerned about what would happen should we have another shutdown. What impact would a future shutdown have at FDA? Finally, I'm interested in understanding some of the long-lasting effects of the shutdown. So if you would, could you just take a moment to discuss the activities that FDA conducted during the shutdown and how it was carried out by your workforce? And in addition, what informed FDA decisions uh, to continue, reduce, or stop altogether its regular activities during the shutdown? Well, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the question. I want to just start out by um, acknowledging the work of, of the people at FDA, um, both those who continue to work in exempt and accepted statuses, meaning that they were able to continue their work because they were either being supported by user fees or their work was considered critical to the protection of the public health, as well as those who are on furlough. I think um, being on furlough and being disconnected from the agency and in work that's important to them was perhaps the most difficult position to find yourself in. And I want to just commend um, their dedication and especially the fortitude of their families through um, what I have said was perhaps the most difficult operational challenge that we faced in modern times through this extended um, shutdown. Um, I, I feel confident um, that things are back on track. I don't think we're going to see significant impacts on our work going forward as a result of the shutdown. I think that owes to the, the dedication and the hard efforts of the men and women of FDA. Um, we will meet, for example, our user fee goals related to medical products um, across most of our programs. Um, there will be some impacts. Certain policy work was delayed. Certain centers were hit particularly hard by the shutdown. For example, for example our food center was. Um, probably 90 percent of the food center was on furlough, so policy work was delayed for um, the five weeks of the shutdown. Um, inspectional work over the course of the year, the number of inspections that we're able to conduct will be diminished. Um, by a, an amount that's commensurate with the length of the shutdown, probably by about 10 percent from where we would have been. Um, but across the board, um, as we get back to full operational strength, and we're there now, uh, and as we assess the impacts across our programs, um, I'm, I'm continued to feel confident um, that we're able to mitigate the hardest impacts and, uh, and that we remain a strong agency. Uh, I want to do a topic. A topic uh related to food safety. Uh, I'd like to stress I'm not criticizing you or your decisions during the shutdown. The Anti-Deficiency Act, which governs legal determinations during a shutdown, says an officer or employee of the United States government may not employ personal services exceeding that authorized by law except for emergencies involving the safety of human life or the protection of property. In 1995, the Justice Department advised OMB Quote, we believe that the emergencies exception applies only to cases of threat to human life or property where the threat can be reasonably said to the near at hand or demanding of immediate response. And as you know, we also fund and oversee food safety and inspection service. Uh, when there's a shutdown, all FSIS inspectors are required to be on the job. And while FS 
FSIS operates under different authorization, the Anti-Deficiency Act only looks to the threat to human life. So can you tell us why you didn't initially bring back inspectors to ensure continuation of high-risk food safety inspections? Well, we, we were guided by prior decisions, um, but none of those prior decisions were sufficiently robust to accommodate all the circumstances that we encountered through this shutdown. Uh, the decisions that we made were consistent with the Anti-Deficiency Act, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, and the legal advice that we obtained and the public health considerations of the circumstances that we, cons we, we encountered in this shutdown. I will say that initially, if you remember, the shutdown occurred just prior to Christmas, and there was thinking that the shutdown would end um, just after Christmas, and we wouldn't have been in a position of conducting inspections over the two-week period of um, the Christmas, uh, Christmas break as well as the week following that. Typically, we wouldn't have many uh, inspections scheduled during that time period. When it became apparent to us that this shutdown was going to be prolonged, and it, when it became apparent to us that the uh, routine inspection work met the standard under the Anti-Deficiency Act for the protection of human life, we very quickly initiated an effort um, to recall inspectors uh, to begin conducting those inspections. I don't believe that we missed um, that many inspections. Uh, at best, we were um, delayed perhaps a week from ramping inspections back up from where we would have been coming off a holiday where we wouldn't have been doing inspectional work. Um, and I just want to close by just acknowledging that these were inspectors who were in unpaid um, accepted positions, who were accruing routine expenses on their government credit cards, even though we were able to offload the expenses of travel and lodging. Um, so they did endure hardship uh, to carry out this mission, and we received an overwhelming response from our inspectional uh, workforce when we called them and recalled them into these important roles, and I just want to acknowledge their, their commitment. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gardner. We've been we have been joined by the distinguished chairman of the Full Appropriations Committee, and at this time I would like to yield to her for an opening statement of whatever comments she might care to make. Well, thank you very much to our distinguished chairman, and welcome, Dr. Gottlieb. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Doctor, I need a little help today. I don't have a voice, but um, first of all, I'd like to thank our chairman, Samford Bishop, and ranking member Jeff Fortenberry for holding this hearing, Commissioner Gottlieb. And I welcome you back before this subcommittee. Among the many effects of the 35-day government shutdown was a sharp reduction in FDA inspections of the nation's food supply. Routine safety inspections of food at high risk of contamination, including seafood and vegetables, grounded to a halt as hundreds of inspectors were furloughed without pay. And while I commend the FDA for taking steps to restore food surveillance, any unexpected break in inspections designed to prevent contamination is simply unacceptable, particularly with foodborne illness sickening 48 million people and killing 3,000 every year in the United States of America. Of course, food inspections weren't the only FDA service curtailed by the shutdown. Applications for new drugs and biologics submitted during the shutdown were also suspended as were policy statements and guidance documents related to drugs and medical devices. Review activities for products not funded by user fees, such as over-the-counter medicines, were also put on hold and pharmaceutical manufacturing inspections were delayed. In short, unfortunately, we cannot repeal the shutdown. And to that end, everyone, including the Trump administration, must work together productively as we head into the fiscal year 2020 budget and appropriations process. And Commissioner Gottlieb, you know that every time you come before the subcommittee, there is that one topic that hangs over our conversation, and that is tobacco products. I do believe that we share a similar goal to eradicate addiction to nicotine and improve public health, but I remain concerned where our paths part. I continue to believe 
that the FDA's decision to exempt e-cigarette manufacturers from pre-market review until 2022 gave the public the false perception that e-cigarettes are safe. They are not. And FDA's decision to take its foot off the gas while thousands of products have entered the market has led to the epidemic we face today. I implore you, do whatever you can to take aggressive action to combat this public health emergency. I know you have a lot to say on the subject, and I look forward to discussing it during questions. And then what's happened? See, did he do his statement? Did he do his statement already? Yes, he did. Oh, so you're allowing. I appreciate the generosity for the chairman, because as you know, I end up with roller skates, <laughs> and I don't want to take advantage as I go from hearing to hearing. But you're very kind. Thank you very much. Commissioner Gottlieb, as you know, eight major allergens are required to be disclosed on food packaging. Although sesame is estimated to afflict nearly a half million Americans, making it one of the six or seven most common food allergens, manufacturers are not currently required to label it in compliance with the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act, which I'm proud to have authored. Took a long time, by the way. Took a long time. It took five years. But I should tell you, uh, that was one, still is one of my proudest achievements, because although it took full time, couldn't get one Republican co-sponsor until five years later, it passed on a voice vote. That's an important, important lesson for all of us, that when you're out there in the community, they finally do what's right. So in May of 2016, I wrote to the FDA in support of adding <coughs> sesame and requesting information on the status of the petition. I'm pleased that in October, FDA announced it would open a 60-day comment period to receive feedback on adding sesame to the list of major allergens, scheduled to conclude in late December in the midst of the shutdown. Did the shutdown add to a delay in processing comments from the scientific community and the public? And when will the FDA announce whether sesame will be added? A question. I'm sorry. I have another one other question because the gen, uh, the chairman is so generous to me. But you can answer that, and he gave me permission to do one other question, and you can guess what that will be about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Chairman. Um, the we received about 4,000 comments to the docket um, related to Sesame. Um, there's no question um, that the the shutdown delayed our, our processing of those comments. We weren't doing work on, on the petition over the course of the five weeks that we had a government shutdown. Um, I share your concerns. Um, we, you know, when you look at sesame, the prevalence of sesame allergy is about on par with the, the eighth allergen. The severity is significant, um, and I don't want to prejudge the outcome of our process, but I will tell you that as, you know, public health professional, we are concerned about it. Um, and are actively looking at whether it meet the criteria for inclusion. We're going through the comments. I'm going to follow the process prescribed by the law, um, but we're going to do it very expeditiously. Because of the generosity of the chairman, I'll, I'll go on to the next question. Thank you. And now, Commissioner Gottlieb, you know the issue that I am so passionate about. I have some e-cigarette questions for you. Jewel argues that its products are intended only for adults looking to transition from cigarettes. Yet it is clear their products are being widely used by kids. In prior comments, you alluded to FDA estimates on the proportion of Jewel's sales that are going to children. Can you share with us what percentage of Jewel's sales are to children? What percentage of Juul's sales from individuals who do not use tobacco products, who did not use tobacco products prior to using Juul? 
Well, I'll just um, say at the outset, um, Mr. Chairman, that this is this is the, one of the biggest public health challenges that we face right now at the agency, the rising youth use of these products. We, we see an opportunity to, to, for these products to be a vehicle for adults, currently addicted adult smokers, to transition off of combustible tobacco onto less harmful but not harmless products. Um, especially at a time that we're advancing regulation to try to regulate nicotine and combustible products to render them minimally and non-addictive for adults who still want to get access to nicotine. But these are not products for children, and we're deeply concerned about the youth use, and we'll be taking very aggressive steps going forward. With respect to your specific question, we did an analysis internally with publicly available data to try to estimate what percentage of Juul's um, reported sales are actually sales to minors. Um, in all candor, our analytics do not meet the level of rigor that I would expect from a sponsor, and that's why I haven't put out that information. Uh, I don't believe it, it, it was, it's reliable, um, but if you want where we, we ended up, we ended up with an estimate of somewhere between 10 or 20 percent of Juul's oh. sales, and this was data looking back at last year. But again, I didn't believe that based on the, our ability to look at publicly available data and make estimates off of that, that it was a reliable estimate. That's why we haven't officially put it out. Well, I can, I, uh, thanks to the chairman, I have one other question, but I can tell you, I visit high schools, junior highs. Every youngster I've interacted with tells me 60% of the class, at a minimum, is using Juul. And I guess Altria thinks it's pretty good because I read about their recent purchase. <clears throat> so I'm very concerned, and I'm glad you're skeptical. In my judgment, from what I see, flavored tobacco products have flooded the market. According to one estimate, there are more than 15,000 e-cigarette flavors available. It should come to no surprise that flavors such as Swedish Fish, Fruit Loops, Gummy Bear appeal to youth. Studies have shown that an estimated 96% of 12 to 17-year-olds who have used e-cigarettes started with a flavored product. And while I appreciate FDA's announcement that it will limit where certain flavored products are sold, to be honest, I don't think that's good enough. FDA needs to take a more aggressive approach to reduce the youth e-cigarette epidemic. Now, you said you don't believe the statistics. I am glad about that. But what would it take for FDA to ban flavors altogether? And what? I ask this question because I go to schools all throughout my district. And just one student came to me just recently and said, you know, one of my class classmates takes the lunch money goes to the local bodega and buys these tutti frutti or chummy gummy or whatever you want to call them. So what data will it take for the FDA to ban flavors altogether? Well, I, I, I hear your stories, um, Congresswoman. I'll be speaking at a high school myself about this, addressing a high school next uh, next Friday. We outlined a series of measures in November. We plan to implement that very shortly. I will implement those measures. Um, we're trying to thread a public health needle here where we, we preserve some element of the availability of these products for adults while foreclosing them for kids or at least really dramatically curtailing the ability of kids to access these products. But I have said to the industry that this is an existential threat. And what I mean by that is that if we're not successful at dramatically curtailing the youth use of these products, and you're, you're right that the flavors are the primary um, vehicle by which the, the children are finding these products attractive, um, we will <coughs> change the application deadlines on these products, and I am willing to pull them off the market if we continue to see the trends going in the direction that they are. I know you're a father of a couple of kids, and I, too, I think you said, and I appreciate your understanding the earth three. <laughs> <laughs> oh, three, I made a mistake. The five-year-old's going to be upset. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you're sensitive to this. We all make mistakes, but this was a big, big, whopping mistake. So I look forward to your work on this, and I thank you so much for the generosity of the chairman for giving me this time. Thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Madam. At this time, I'm pleased to recognize the, the new ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Fortenberry, um, 
who uh, was not here to give his opening statement, so I'd like to recognize him at this time for an opening statement, and uh, if he would like, uh, he can proceed with his questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for the delay, but thank you for your uh, generosity in allowing me to combine an opening statement plus some questions. And uh, first, let me say, though, Mr. Chairman, I've enjoyed our, our pre-meeting conversations and uh, our robust interest in many, many things in terms of our own food security in this country and how we develop and continue to lead the world in terms of food innovation. And I'm grateful for your leadership in this regard and continue to look forward to working with all of you in this space. Uh, Dr. Gottlieb, welcome. Thank you for your service. We appreciate uh, your expertise and your commitment to, again, the highest ideals of public service as well. Um, I would begin to venture to guess that most Americans do not fully grasp the breadth and depth of the agency that you head. Uh, the FDA's mandate touches our food, our drugs, our medical devices, much, much more, regulating roughly 25 cents of every consumer dollar spent in America. So our work not only covers the expenditures supporting the professionals who you work with overseeing these products and services, but we also have to ensure that these resources are spent wisely. Um, in this coming appropriation that you just received, you've got a significant increase, about 9 percent, uh, over the f previous year. Of course, in Washington, we, we operate off good intention, more money means good outcomes, but we have to be careful about that set of working assumptions. So I want to hear about what you intend to do about outcomes, and I'll be a little more specific. Tell us about your plans regarding faster generic drug appro approval, advancements in digital health technology, uh, the continuous manufacturing of drugs, uh, as well as keeping our food safe. Um, I think it's important for the panel, and I know it's a cl clear personal interest to you, regarding the grim, the grim factors, the grim epidemic of drug overdose uh, that is taking 70,000 American lives each year. It's a particularly devastating problem among young people. So, but I'm particularly interested as well and worried about the safety of certain foods. Uh, recently, I held an informal gathering of agricultural pioneers in my home state of Nebraska in which food safety issues were of particular concern. Uh, while we're increasingly and excitingly getting more of our food from local sources uh, where the provenance of the product can reliably be determined, we still import a lot of food from around the world where the standards of inspection potentially don't match our own. So, as I understand it, 90% of our seafood, over half our fresh fruit, and over a third of our fresh vegetables are imported, which are certainly staggering numbers. Americans, again, are worried about drug prices, and while I realize you only play a partial role in debating the policy as to how to bring down these prices and increasing values to, to, uh, to patients, I, I hope that we will see a robust plan to accelerate generic approvals and to minimize the perverse effects of circumventing drug and device patents, as well as to encourage more safe manufacture of the generics themselves. So, um, Dr. Gottlieb, you have many challenges, so I look forward to your responses. Embedded in that statement, I think were enough questions for you to uh, leverage off of. Should I respond? It's your time, okay. yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Well, uh, let me, um, let me um, start with the, the pricing issue, if that's okay, since that's where you ended. I think that when it comes to drug pricing, I see three challenges. First is that there are situations where we, we lack product competition, and I think there's a lot that I can do to help solve that challenge. There's situations where we have branded drugs that are off patent, off exclusivity, but aren't subject to the generic competition that Congress intended for, either because branded companies are gaming the system in ways that's blocking competition, or we don't have the scientific tools to allow the genericization of certain drugs. The second challenge that I see is once there is competition in the market, we have payment systems set up that sometimes don't allow government programs to take advantage of that competition. And I see that particularly in the injectable drug market with respect to Medicare Part B, where the government is largely a price taker and those drugs aren't competitively bid. Um, I think this is particularly acute as we see more biosimilars coming to the market where government could be taking advantage of effectively generic, you know, like versions of biological products, but we don't competitively bid those drugs. And then the third challenge is that when we do have competition in the market and the competition dr does drive discounting, the discounting comes in the form of back-ended rebates that don't flow to the consumer. They flow back to the health insurer. They're used to offset the cost of everyone's premiums. 
but it effectively means that the patient who's using the expensive drug and is either paying full freight or is out of pocket for a large portion of that drug is spending money that's being used, that's being paid back later, but paid back in a form that's used to subsidize the premium costs of healthy people, which is the exact inverse of what we expect when it comes to uh, comes to an insurance scheme. But we, we at FDA are focused on the first element of that challenge, um, which is how do we operationalize programs to bring more generic competition to the market? The resources we got from this committee will help advance those goals. Um, we're putting in place a structured review for the, for the generic drug program that's going to make it much more efficient to, to um, adjudicate the generic review process. And we're also going to spend some of those resources proactively updating the labels on old generic drugs to try to drive their utilization. We have generic drugs that form, for example, the backbone of chemotherapy regimens that have labels on them that are decades out of date. And there is no, no sponsor in the market who's able to update that label anymore. The branded company has long since gotten out of the market or maybe doesn't even exist anymore. With the resources that you provided us, we're going to proactively take it upon ourselves to update those labels with, with modern information so that we can help drive use of those drugs where those drugs are still clinically relevant. How much will this lower drug cost? It's you know it's a good question, um, Congressman, and and we have we have quantified um, the impact of our work. Uh, the Council of Economic Advisors put out a report about three or four months ago where they quantified the impact of the increased rate of generic approvals that we've achieved over the last two years. And I, if I remember correctly, we've increased the sort of run rate for approvals, if you will, by 18 percent a month. There, we've, we've had incremental improvements in our productivity, and they, they did tie a number around that. I'm forgetting it offhand, but it was substantial. I'm hopeful that the resources that you provided and the policies we're implementing over the course of this year are going to continue to help us advance more generic um, development, not just more approvals, but more approvals of drugs that face obstacles um, being genericized. And what I'm talking about particularly is the complex drugs, drugs that are either inhaled drugs, they're topical drugs, they're injectable drugs where they're complex formulations and can't be easily measured in the blood. So the traditional framework of Hatch-Waxman makes it hard to copy those drugs. That's where we've been focused. This is not a trivial category of spend. Someone has estimated, one analyst estimated, that it's about $20 billion a year in drug spending for drugs that are off patent, off exclusivity, but still, still, still sold as branded drugs because they don't face generic competition because they're hard to copy. We're focused on that, cop that category. EpiPen was one such example, and some of the metered dose inhalers for asthma were another example, and we've been able to genericize those in recent months. So, so doctor, if, um, if you could give an estimate, even if it's rough, that you won't be held to if this set of policies fully implemented over a short period of time, in the aggregate, what would that impact be on drug prices? Well, the are, we, are we looking at 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent? Well, the estimate that the that CEA put out was, if I remember correctly, in the billions of dollars. 26 billion was the estimate that CEA put out. Was that over a year or over 10 years? From January. So over a year, they, Maybe they we estimated. Maybe get a, a, a better stat, just the percent of how much that will in fact we could drug translate prices it in into the next, that. throughout the hearing. If you could get that, that would be The stat helpful. would be in the aggregate. We could translate it into the aggregate. Okay. Um, before my time expires, um, is our impor imported food safe? I believe our imported food is safe, and I have confidence in it. You made the opening statement that uh, um, about 15 percent of our food is imported overall, but, but to, your, to your credit, you made the comment that it's, it varies across food types. Seafood is a very high percentage. Produce, I think you mentioned, is about half of the produce. Um, we employ different methods with respect to uh, imported food than we do to domestic food. We have a multi-layered approach where we rely on foreign regulators. We target inspections very carefully with our PREDICT system. We rely on third-party certification. We rely on verification by importers that they've conducted certain audits. We have a multi-layered system when it comes to imported food. I have confidence in the imported food, um, but across our entire portfolio, we still have a lot of work to do to continue to provide the assurance of safety that consumers expect when it comes to the food that they eat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coquette. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here. Appreciate it. Um, first, just let me say, uh, from what I understand, your department may be one of the few federally that where morale is up in the last couple of years, and I know I want to give you credit and kudos for that, because that's uh, 
it stands out, and it's from what we're hearing talking to folks. As you know, a lot of companies in my area work with the FDA. Um, I know you know Kevin Conroy from Exact Sciences, for example. Uh, I would love to extend an invitation if you'd like to visit some of the companies. Maybe wait a couple months if you're coming to Wisconsin. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it next week. Um, go ice fishing. <laughs> I, I still don't understand ice fishing. I got to admit. So, <laughs> but uh, we'd love to have you come to Wisconsin. So, um, I'd like to try to get into three different subjects if I can. And one um, is around uh, what you're just talking a little bit about generic. Uh, you've talked about that a number of times before the committee, and I really appreciate your efforts on that. As we know, there's a large amount of drugs that are under the generic area. You get one competitor, you can lower the price 6%. You get another one, 48%. You get six of them, you're down to a quarter of the price. What are we doing specifically to spur the development of multiple generic competitors? So we've implemented a policy, uh, I'll be brief, we've implemented a policy to prioritize the review of generic applications until we have three generic competitors within a category because that's where you see the biggest price break. And we've actually updated that data. That data was developed the last time I was at the agency back in 2005 and we updated it and it's very consistent. The, the new findings are very consistent with the old findings in terms of where you see the sharp price reduction. It's when three competitors are into the market. So you're working specifically? We're specifically target. prioritizing applications until there are three competitors within each category. Great. Uh, second issue area um, around some CBD issues. Uh, it's kind of, kind of an A and a B. The first one um, is, you know, under the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018, uh, hemp was removed as a Schedule One controlled substance. I was just wondering if the FDA has plans to work with the USDA on CBD regulations. Secondly, um, I know there was uh, recently an issue around uh, CBD and food. Uh, I think the statement that came out at the end of last year said there could be a possible pathway by which certain hemp-derived uh, compounds such as CBD might be permitted in food or dietary supplements. I guess my question is how actively is the FDA pursuing this pathway and what is the likelihood and timeline for the FDA to issue a regulation to clarify the lawful circumstances under which CBD could be used in food or dietary supplements? Well, I'll say at the outset, Congressman, we heard Congress loud and clear with respect to that legislation. Uh, and I understand Congress wants there to be a pathway for CBD to be available. Um, this is not a straightforward issue. Um, Congress specifically preserved our authorities with respect to CBD, um, our drug authorities, and CBD, as you, do, as you know, exists in a higher formulation as a pharmaceutical product uh, and can't be legally put in the food supply at this time, because not only because it's a drug product, but it is also sub the subject of substantial clinical investigation, and we have active INDs. So even if it wasn't an approved product, it would still be su the subject of substantial clinical investigation, and statutorily, it couldn't go into the food supply. Now, the law does allow us to go through a regulatory process and do go through notice and comment rulemaking to establish a framework to allow it to be put in the food supply. We would have to work through that. We plan to begin with a public meeting at some time in April. We'll be announcing that shortly. We'll solicit comments, and we've got to work through what that regulation would look like. Um, you know, I can speculate at a high level about some theoretical frameworks that you can contemplate. For example, the product existing in a high concentration, pure formulation as a pharmaceutical product while existing in a different concentration um, as a food product or a dietary supplement because we, we want to preserve the incentive to study CBD as a pharmaceutical product. We believe it does have therapeutic value and it's been demonstrated. Um, but this is, I, I will tell you, this is not um, a straightforward process. There's not a good proxy for us doing this through regulation. And if we get comments back and find that this is sufficiently complicated for the agency, we will come back and have a discussion with Congress about how we might be able to work together on this. Great, thank you. And a third one, I'll try to get in, in if I can. Um, uh, this is around uh, drug shortages. Uh, I, there's been conversations around the abbreviated new drug application. Um, it's a, it, it's designated for priority renewal um, when reviewers are directed to prioritize the review every step of the way beyond the initial um, priority designation stage. Is there a way to shorten timelines more aggressively and actively communicate and advise uh, folks to get faster approval under um, this issue to address drug shortages? Well, we have a drug shortages list, and, and we maintain um, a lot of transparency around that. And that, that group, it's a large group now, um, 
works to try to provide timely information about where shortages persist in the market. Congress gave us very explicit authorities to allow us to receive notification from sponsors of an impending shortage, and we provide notification around that. Um, and when we do um, have a drug that we believe either is going to go into shortage or is on a shortage list, we do prioritize um, the ability to get product on the market either through um, other approvals or sometimes we've allowed limited reimportation under very specific circumstances to help mitigate the shortages. And thank you. Dr. Harris. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Ali. I think, uh, I think we're getting a lot of things right over at FDA. Um, I have a four or five different topics. I'll be brief about them. Uh, look, uh, first of all, with regards to fiber, I know we've communicated about it. I want to thank you for handling those, di you know, continuing to handle dietary fiber position, uh, petitions uh, in front of the FDA. And I know uh, the food manufacturers, uh, in, you know, in Maryland are very, uh, they, they want to comply with the January 1st deadline. They hope that, you know, FDA will work with them to make sure they can, uh, uh, they can figure out what the, What's a dietary fire? What what they ought to do with their labeling, et cetera? I want to thank you for you know paying attention to that. Uh, with regards to the cigar issue, we we talk about it a lot. Uh, you know, I, and uh, first off, I want to uh, you know it's great that combustible product use is going down in the United States. Uh, clear, clearly, the youth usage, usage of cigars goes down year after year, and yet there's a, uh, a, a plan to ban all the flavored, you know, cigars, which aren't really used by youth very And again, cigar use going down by down, down uh, year by year. Uh, what is the justification for banning all the, you know, flavored cigars? Well, Congressman, I'll, I'll be direct on this. I don't believe that there should be characterizing flavors in combustible tobacco. Um, data shows that it, the, the characterizing flavors in the combustible tobacco um, drive youth use. Congress made an explicit decision to take characterizing flavors out of cigarettes, and then we saw a lot of the flavors go into these cigarellos. When you look at youth use patterns of tobacco products, um, cigars is the fastest growing tobacco segment among black youth. Um, and a lot of that is the flavored cigar use among that uh, population. But we see rising youth use of flavored cigarillos across the board. So I have a lot of public health concerns around the flavors in cigars. I mean, if I had an optimal configuration um, with respect to tobacco, if people wanted to get, if adults wanted to get access to flavored products, they would, they would get access to flavored products that weren't combustible products and didn't have all the health risks associated um, with combustion of tobacco. Well, uh, you know, we treat you. You, men, you talk as though com, com, all combustible ta tobacco is equal, and obviously, something that's not inhaled has a much lower risk profile than something that's inhaled. So that, that's why I say, we, you know, the, the one size fits all approach. I'm just not sure is well, you know is justified here. So anyway, the other thing is, I know you we've worked with you on uh, you know marketing uh, tobacco rolling paper to children. Uh, I don't think that the uh, you know the Center for Tobacco Products has has come to a satisfactory. Uh, result with this. I think there's still marketing going on to children. Uh, obviously, rolling paper is not used for anything but a combustible product, whether it's marijuana or tobacco. And, uh, you know, I, I know you have the authority uh, to regulate and to take enforcement action, and I hope you do. With regards to opioids and naloxone uh, co-prescription, co uh, I think that uh, your statement yesterday on FDA's policy and regulatory agenda to combat opioid abuse didn't mention co-prescription of naloxone. Could you just give me an update on where, what, what your efforts are and what your thoughts are on uh, allowing co-prescription? We're actively considering the co-prescribing of naloxone um, with opioids. We had a discussion around this at an advisory committee recently, probably about um, six weeks ago. Um, and we're going through different formulations of m under what circumstance that would be appropriate from a public health standpoint. You know, we're mandating co-prescribing of naloxone across the board for all opioids would be costly to the system, uh, but there might be circumstances where um, there's a public health, strong public health justification um, for mandating that. Great. No, thank you very much, and I, I appreciate, you know, the thoughtful consideration of that. Uh, I'm going to agree with the gentleman from Wisconsin that, you know, the CBD, and we've also talked about that, that, uh, you know, uh, I go into markets now and see these displays of CBD-containing products, uh, and it's not at the pharmacy where, you know, behind the counter uh, obtained with a prescription. Uh, so again, uh, I, I think this is something that, that crept up on us, and we, we've, uh, you know, I'd I, I know I appreciate your, uh, your answer. 
uh, to Mr. Pocan on that. Uh, finally, uh, with regards to sodium, you know, I've uh, asked for years, uh, you know, the, the, the question of whether, a, again, a one-size-fits-all approach is the appropriate approach on sodium. I know that your predecessor, Dr. Califf, other established scientists, have, you know, called for in a, uh, you know, American Heart Association publication last July that, that perhaps it's time to do a randomized trial on, on sodium. And, and, to, and to answer the question, uh, you know, where is it harmful, where is it helpful? Yes, the majority of people probably might benefit from a sodium reduction, but there are individuals who wouldn't. Uh, and uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't it help, wouldn't a, a randomized control trial actually help inform, you know, regulation? I think we'd, re we'd welcome more research on any, any dietary subject, um, and it, there's certainly precedent where Congress has helped support this kind of research through the NIH, for example. It's obviously hard to study dietary habits, you can't randomize people carefully in a way you would in a drug trial, for instance, but we have done research on, on diet and have gotten good results from those research in the past to okay. inform decision making. Thank you very much. Yield back. Mr. Cuellar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, uh, let me ask a question uh, following uh, what uh, my colleague asked. Prior to 2001, opioids such as uh, OxyContin were solely approved for short-term pain relief. However, in 2001, the FDA decided to change the label uh, for that, uh, allowing it for daily, around-the-clock, long-term treatment. And I think um, the problem that I have with that, I, I don't think there was any studies uh, that, um, you know, they were showing uh, the impact of this long-term effects of opioids. Now, I don't want you to go back and explain the reasoning of the FDA in 2001, but I would like, uh, to, if you can, explain why after um, uh, scientific studies have shown the negative long-term effects of opiate usage, why the FDA has not acted to change the wording of OxyContin labor and issue uh, uh, stern warnings about opiate usage? Yeah, well, I appreciate the question, Congressman. I have gone back and looked at the history and, and, and spoken to my staff about what was done in 2001. And in 2001, a specific label change that was made, that's the subject of some um, some analysis now was an attempt to try to restrict and narrow the use of the drug. Uh, I think in retrospect, the agency probably got some of the wording in that, in, in that change wrong. It was an, ex an attempt to try to drive long-term use away from some of the IR drugs. If you look at utilization of opioids, 90% of, more than 90% of all the use of opioids is actually the immediate release formulations of the drug, not the extended release of the drug. And the agency at the time was trying to obviate the use of, of um, extended release drugs just to situations where pa patients had syndromes that required longer term use of opioids. Now that said, and recognizing that some of that language was done in a way that um, ultimately allowed for promotion that was inappropriate and I think criminally um, sanctioned ultimately, um, we have undertaken a process to use the authorities that we got under the Support Act to now mandate that the sponsors of existing opioids that are on the market as well as opioids in development must conduct long-term studies looking at the long-term effectiveness um, with chronic administration of opioids to see, to demonstrate whether or not there's a decline in effectiveness. If we're able to demonstrate that there's a decline in effectiveness with prolonged administration of these drugs um, in rigorous studies, which are the types of studies that we're mandating, we could uh, act to restrict the labels further to contraindicate certain use, to narrow the circumstances when um, opioids could be used in a long-term fashion to implement other risk management measures. So we are undertaking that process very quickly using the authorities you gave us under the Support Act uh, to get the evidence we need to support a careful regulatory decision here. Well, I would, uh, I think all of us would appreciate it if you can keep us posted on, on that work as, uh, as you know, we appropriate billions and billions of dollars to address the opiate issue that we have. So we appreciate uh, you keeping us informed. Uh, the other question I have has to do with compound pharmacists. Um, FDA has heard concerns about healthcare provider groups about the need for immediate access to compound office use medications to address health emergency. Uh, the FDA enforcement action against 503A facilities for providing office use medications, despite, despite being permitted by state law uh, and or regulation in a majority of states, continues to restrict, and I understand the history, there was an issue of uh, people being killed, uh, I understand that dying, but I guess my question is, when we talk about compound pharmacists or the pharmacists and how they're regulated, um, it, it, there's a little confusion between the state, federal uh, uh, definitions, especially with the definitions of distribute and dispense. Are y'all looking at trying to 
somehow align those definitions? Because if you have a state and then you have a federal uh, definition, that will cause some sort of um, uh, confusion. Well, I think that the the intent of Congress was clear here in terms of and 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 clear in terms of how the agency is implementing. And I think we've been clear. Um, that we do not believe that a 503A pharmacy can engage in large-scale manufacturing and advanced shipping. Um, a, a 503A pharmacy should be engaged in the traditional practice of pharmacy where they are compounding a drug in response to an individual patient prescription. Now, I understand some 503A pharmacies do want to engage in larger-scale manufacturing and stock local doctors' practices, and, and will argue they've done, done that for years and they've done it safely. I recognize that. Um, but those are the kinds of conditions that created the, the public health risks that led to the passage of the DQSA and the implementation of a new regimen. Now, from my standpoint, what I want to do is try to make it as efficient as possible for the 503A pharmacies that want to engage in that activity to become 503B pharmacies where they're subject to at least good manufacturing practices oversight to ensure the safety of those products. So I am very actively trying to work through policy and we're gonna be issuing guidance imminently that I hope will make it more affordable for some small 503A pharmacies to engage in, in the business that they want to, but to do it as 503B pharmacies. So to do that conversion, it doesn't cost millions of dollars, so a smaller pharmacy can do it. Um, I'll say just, and I'll close here, from an economic standpoint, if a 503A pharmacy is doing this on a small scale, they might be able to do it and evade notice. But once they try to do it on any scale, any, any scale um, they're going to get on the, on the radar of not just the state officials, but the federal officials. So they're effectively capped. If they would convert to be a 503B pharmacy, they would allow they would be able to grow their business into that segment that they want to be. And I think it'd be a much more enviable position that, for them to be in. I'm trying to make it efficient for them to get there. Yeah, I know my time's up, but I appreciate the efficiency on that. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Molinar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Commissioner Gottlieb. Thank you for uh, your comments today and also your leadership, and especially in the area of um, keeping the price of drugs down and, and promoting competition and reducing barriers to the generic uh, development and promoting uh, competition. Um, one of the areas I kind of along those lines I wanted to ask you about is that we uh, have invested, in, I know, in NIH and other areas where um, non-addictive pain medicine, there's a lot of research going on in that area. Is that something you're seeing uh, as a potential answer to this uh, opioid crisis, and, and what role does the FDA have in that? Well, it's, it's one opportunity. I think the, the, um, what we do to address this crisis is gonna be an all of the above approach, and there is no silver bullet given the magnitude of this public health crisis that we're facing. But there are opportunities for us, I believe, um, to help advance the development of non-opioid alternatives for the treatment of pain. We will be issuing, uh, over the course of this year, we withdrew our guidance document that delineated what sponsors needed to do to get pain drugs onto the market because we felt it was out of date and overly burdensome. And in its place, we're gonna be issuing a series of guidance documents, at least four, that look at um, what sponsors need to do to develop alternatives to opioids for the treatment of specific kinds of pain. And we think that that will make the process for trying to develop the alternatives that you're talking about uh, much more efficient. So we're focused on this. Okay, wonderful. And uh, I want to just change gears a little bit to go to your rulemaking uh, area. Um, almost a year ago, the FDA announced an advance notice of proposed rulemaking regarding regulatory treatment of premium cigars. And can you tell me what the status is of that rulemaking? We received a lot of comments. I forget how many in all, um, but it was a robust administrative record. We're continuing to go through those comments, um, and you know we will keep you updated. I mean, we, we specifically asked questions around whether or not there were different patterns of use associated with premium cigars. Um, that would cause us to consider um, whether we should regulate them differently than other tobacco products. That was among the questions that we asked, and so um, we're still actively engaged in, in that rulemaking process. Okay, um, thank you. And then yesterday, the FDA published a proposed rule aimed at strengthening regulations of over-the-counter sunscreen. And uh, I am 100% in agreement, we wanna make sure these sunscreen products are effective and available. Um, some of the concerns that have been raised are that the tentative final over-the-counter sunscreen monograph will essentially ban all but two of the approved UV filters used in sunscreen products. 
And my understanding is there's only 90 days to comment and provide data for widely used ingredients that have no known safety concerns. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on where things stand on that and is, uh, does the FDA have plans to ensure there's no disruption in the supply of these critical products as we start to approach the summer months? Right, so the, the, they will not be banned and they will not be forced to come off the market. There were 16 currently marketed active ingredients that were assessed in that notice of proposed rulemaking. Two were determined to be GRACE, uh, generally regarded as safe and effective, zinc oxide and titanium oxide. Two were not determined to be GRACE, as they have to come off the market, but they're actually not currently marketed in the U.S. The other 12 ingredients had insufficient data for us to make a final determination. In the course of the 90 days, if a sponsor wants to, they can ask for a deferral of a decision uh, on those, uh, those other 12 ingredients. We expect at least six to eight of those ingredients to request and be granted deferrals. Um, and we can finalize the rule, allow those products to stay on the market while we continue to collect data. We did the same thing with respect to the rulemaking on the antiseptics. We were under a court order to finalize that rule, but we didn't have the data we needed to make a final determination on all the antiseptic products. So we were able to issue deferrals on some of those products and finalize the rule while we continue to collect information. So they will not necessarily be coming off the market just because we have insufficient information to make a safety determination at this time. Okay, thank you. And then uh, one last question I had for you is on relative to milk. Uh, my district is a strong agriculture district, very diverse uh, dairy is a big part of that. And, and uh, one of the questions I have is, um, you know, the labeling of milk, what constitutes milk, you know, the FDA's definition and how we protect that definition. Uh, can you comment on where we are on that? Because I continue to hear concerns uh, from my constituents about this? Well, we're going through a process, a regulatory process right now where we have soliciting public uh, opinion about the use of the term milk on, on non-dairy products, on plant-based milk products, which I think is what your question is, is getting at. Um, and, you know, we are going through that process. I don't want to prejudge the outcome, but from a public health standpoint, um, the threshold where we would make a decision about that standard of identity and when you can use the term milk would be, for example, to give you one example, a situation where we're able to demonstrate with data or, or people are able to demonstrate with data that um, consumers perceive a certain nutritional content through the use of the term milk that they're not getting with plant-based products, and that's having an adverse health impact on them. And we have, in fact, seen examples of that where parents fed their children um, uh, certain certain milk products and they didn't have the vitamins and nutrition of dairy milk products and you saw um, adverse um, adverse consequences so that's what we would be looking at thank you, thank you. Ms. McCollum thank you mr. chair um, sir I'm gonna kind of dovetail on uh, a little bit of what the last question was about not milk but cosmetics um, a recent New York Times editorial highlighted the FDA's role in ensuring safety of uh, cosmetic products on the market and how little authority you actually have in regulating them. Um, it's a $70 billion cosmetic industry, which includes not only makeup, but products every single one of us use in this room. Any of you use toothpaste, deodorant? Well, it's regulated with an $8 million budget only and 27 staff members at the FDA. The law giving you the authority to ensure the safety of these projects, uh, products is only two pages long, and it hasn't been updated since 1938. While there have been several attempts to uh, enact legislation that would provide the FDA with expansive authority and oversight, Congress has been unsuccessful in passing any substantial legislation. To, to this day, 80 years have passed. Cosmetic companies still do not need to submit safety data to the FDA before marketing a product. They are not held to basic good manufacturing practices. They do not have to register with the agency. They are not required to report adverse events that consumers may rely, relate to them. Further, the FDA can currently not uh, do a mandatory recall of a product, even if it's thought to cr uh, cause serious harm. It cannot inspect facilities to ensure that the products are being made in a safe and clean environments, and less than 1% of imported cosmetics are even inspected. Clearly, you do not have the authority to meaningfully regulate cosmetic industry the way I'm sure most Americans assume that you do. And just talking to mothers, fathers, um, uh, elders, and young, young adults, they think 
that these have all been tested and safe to use when they go to the store to buy a product for themselves or their family. The FDA has taken steps with sunscreen, and I applaud the FDA for doing that because that's a serious health risk if someone's applying something to their skin thinking it's going to block or delay um, or prevent uh, cancer. So I'm asking you, what are some of your biggest hurdles in ensuring the safety of these products? Because I'm sure you get calls and you do hear from consumers who say, well, I thought you inspected this. I thought there was consumer protection. So Congress needs to update these adequate laws and, and adequate laws. And so what are some of the changes that you would suggest that we work on um, in, a, in a fashion to make sure that these products are safe, as many uh, people assume that they are. Thank you. Well, I'll just say briefly, Congresswoman, I think you outlined um, some of the challenges very well. Um, and this is an area that we want to work on. Uh, we, we very much look forward to working on with Congress um, to try to modernize not just this framework, um, but we can always do more with more with respect to the resources. You are right that it is a small team. Um, you know, now, when you're looking at our portfolio from a risk-based approach, these products clearly pose um, a, a, a smaller degree of risk than a complicated medical device or a pharmaceutical product, um, but they're not risk-free, uh, and we have not been able to um, expand the scope of what we're able to do commensurate with the expansion in the scope of this industry. And so we would like to work with you on this um, and see how we can make this system more robust. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I, as is the doctor pointed out, um, we don't even know uh, how much uh, harm um, these products could be because there's no accumulation being reported in it. I know that uh, the drugs that we take and medical devices, as the doctor pointed out, can have an immediate effect of uh, a good outcome or a terrible outcome, and those are reported, and we do know about it. But I, I, as with sunscreen, there is a false sense of security in the public that um, they read they read a label, they think it's been inspected. So, Mr. Chair, I think it's something that um, our committee should take a look at. I thank uh, the FDA for uh, looking at this issue, and I look forward to working with the chair uh, on this. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Um, Mr. Adderholt, the distinguished former chair of the subcommittee. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and uh, congratulations on your chairmanship and uh, on the special on this first hearing of the subcommittee. It's uh, great to be alongside of you. And Commissioner Godley, Godley welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Of course, uh, I'm no longer chair of the subcommittee, but uh, I, I wanted to remain on this uh, subcommittee and ask to be uh, to uh, have a seat on the subcommittee, and I can continue to actively be interested in the matters that and that uh, you work on and this committee subcommittee works on, and look forward to working uh, with you. I want to follow up on uh, the uh, uh, chair of the full committee uh, was asking about with tobacco, um, and uh, I think. All of us remain concerned about youth access uh, to flavored tobacco products, and particularly e-cigarettes. And uh, it's not—it's not, it's not a partisan issue. Democrats and Republicans alike are, are very concerned about that issue, especially with the uh, with the youth uh, access. Uh, some members of Congress propose raising the federal minimum tobacco age to sell to 21. What's FDA's position on that? Uh, we would support that, and I'll tell you, um, my my position is that 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 I would be supporter of that. And and from my perspective, with respect to um, the e-cigarette challenge we're facing right now, where we want to preserve this opportunity for currently addicted adult smokers, but face a sheer epidemic of youth use of these products, and the numbers are going to go up uh, this year as well, and perhaps significantly. A lot of the youth access isn't just 14-year-olds and 15-year-olds going into convenience stores and buying these products. It's enterprising 18-year-olds in high school buying them legally and creating a business in their high school, selling them back to 16-year-olds and 15-year-olds. And if we had um, a 21 age limit uh, across the board on these products, it would make it harder for that kind of activity to take place. And so I think it could help me address the most immediate problem that I'm facing with respect to tobacco, which is the epidemic of youth use of these non-combustible products. Yeah, and I, I and I've been supportive of that uh, that as well. Of course, raising the minimum tobacco age uh, of sale to 21 could drive more uh, minors to purchase uh, uh, flavored tobacco products online. Uh, I think that's one issue that we deal with. What does FDA need in terms of authority to implement effective age verification policy for online sale of tobacco products? 
We have all the authority we need, and we'll be promulgating guidance that is going to outline age verification requirements for online sales that we think are sufficient to allow on online sales to continue. Um, currently, only a small percentage of the e-cigarette sales that are, that are taking place are online. It's actually a small number of uh, the products are being bought online. But I do think that the online route um, provides the opportunity for heightened age verification requirements that, while not foolproof, nothing's foolproof, and that's not the standard that, that we're, I think we're going to be able to reasonably achieve, make it much more difficult for youth to get access to those products online. Um, you see, for example, wine sales online, liquor sales online, um, that require sign adult signature on delivery and very stringent verification requirements that, again, while not foolproof, um, are pretty good. And, and we can look for the similar technology with respect to online e-cigarette sales. Do, do you have the authority to mandate age verification? Um, we believe we do. We're going to be promulgating guidance that's going to um, require significantly heightened age verification requirements um, for um, flavored e-cigarette products sold in convenience stores um, and products sold um, through online channels, and we'll be implementing that shortly. Well, I know Juul uh, requires online customers to either upload a government issue ID uh, or the last four digits of their social security number or other identification num uh, information. Is this something the FDA could require of all the companies to sell tobacco products online? Yeah, I don't want to judge one process over the other. What we're going to do is give some representative examples of some processes that could be sufficient and allow um, sponsors to submit other alternatives, um, other creative alternatives. But we do believe that there is technology and ways to put in place online verification requirements that could be robust uh, and could meet a, a standard that we would think is sufficient. Let me just, I know my time's running out, but let me ask about uh, the, uh, of course, FDA and USDA has signed the MOU uh, outlining how both agencies will be involved in this regulating cell cultured protein in October. Uh, what's the status of the MOU? Um, very close to completion um, and, and public release. We'll, we'll absolutely meet the 60-day deadline that was in the, uh, um, in the appropriations legislation. And so I look forward to uh, hopefully having the opportunity to brief you on that. And uh, I would just want to close by thanking you for the support that you showed the agency over the years when you chaired the committee. Sure. Well, and one last, will FDA allow USDA to play a role in the collection of the cell uh, from animals both po post and ante mortem? Um, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm quite understanding the question, but the way that we, we've de de designed the process is we've designed a pre- and post-harvest um, phase. And so the pre-harvest phase is the living biosystem. Mm -hmm. Once that living system um, is basically closed and the, the meat product is taken out of the biological um, re replication process, that entirely, that, all that jurisdiction shifts to USDA. So there's a handoff there somewhere. USDA plays a role in that handoff and then has jurisdiction over all aspects of how the product's formed, spiced, packaged, labeled, everything else. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Pingui. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Gottlieb, for being here with us. I always appreciate your, uh, the time you take with our committee and the thorough answers that you give on every topic. So thank you. And thank you for your vigilance around flavored e-cigarettes. That's an issue we hear a lot about in our communities as well. Um, I'm going to try to fit in two quick, uh, two issues and be quick about it. Um, my uh, colleague, Mr. Pocan, already got into the CBD discussion, and so he's reviewed quite a bit of that with you. And as you know, we've recently sent a letter um, and uh, I realize this is complicated, but I just want to um, emphasize the need for some sense of urgency around it and, um, um, you know, the timing of this because so many of our states had legalized hemp, have growers going on, as you've heard from many other members, um, CDBD is being sold in a lot of places and it's created an enormous amount of confusion. My own state legislature is working on legislation around it right now, but the role of the FDA confuses everyone, I think. So um, I guess I'm wondering about uh, how soon you can do this. Are there resources available? Um, or do you need further assistance to get this done? And maybe this is premature, but I, I know you sort of alluded to the potential for a legislative fix. And given that you're looking at it kind of in what might be a um, pharmaceutical component and then what might be uh, you know other sized uh, doses or products that would not be regulated in the same way. Um, I will tell you that we're we're 
deeply focused on this. We have taken on other hard challenges before. I think we have a good track record of um, trying to come to resolution um, on other challenges, and you have my commitment that I'm focused on this one. Uh, I'm going to announce shortly a high-level working group that's going to report to me on this with some senior officials in the agency who are going to be chairing that. Um, we want to wait for the public meeting and solicit comments and get input. Um, I, I will tell you that if we make a determination that the pathway here is going to be a multi-year regulatory process that could take two, three, four years, uh, I will come back to Congress and have a discussion about whether or not there are other frameworks that could help address this. Again, I want to preserve the pharmaceutical opportunity here um, while recognizing that Congress intended for there to be a pathway for this product to be available in other forms. And I think that there are different things we can contemplate scientifically. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but you could think about concentration and formulation and other thresholds. Um, that might or might not be something we can do in regulation. We might need statute that either addresses this as a whole framework or addresses CBD specifically. Uh, if that's the case, we will work through a process to have a discussion around that. Great. Well, we will um, stay in close touch and look forward to you know, any decisions that you make uh, soon. Um, the second is on the pricing of prescription drugs, and you've already had several questions about this, and I really appreciate your answers relating to generics, um, rebates, um, negotiating all the things that could be done, but all the things that, that you have some say over it. I know in July of 2018, um, Secretary Azar directed the FDA to establish a working group to examine safe importation of prescription drugs. That's an issue I've been concerned about for a long time. Uh, living in a border state, which Maine is, um, we've toyed with this at a state level and had to go back and forth. Um, so I'm very interested in what the FDA's working group uh, is thinking about this. And um, just to emphasize the point, because prescription drug pricing is so critical, um, we called a couple of pharmacies. You know, in our state, you can literally cross the border, and if you have a duly licensed physician who writes your prescription, you can buy um, across the border. Um, Advair, which is, as you know, is used to treat asthma and bronchitis, one of the top selling drugs was a um, a cash price of 378 at the main pharmacy across the border. It was $140 in Canada. Even worse, given the crisis that we have with insulin right now, cash price for a vial of insulin, which was first used in 1922, was $200 in Maine, a price many families can't afford and we're hearing more and more about every day. But that same vial of Humalog is available for $35 at the Canadian pharmacy. Um, you know, I've worked on this issue for so long, and people try to raise red flags. You know, maybe it's not safe. Maybe there's something else. Uh, I know from living in a border state that Canadians have safe drugs and pleasant, well-lit pharmacies where they go to purchase them, and you really can't tell the difference in any way. So um, I'd love to be updated and follow your progress in this. Um, Canadians have safe drugs, and if you go into a Canadian brick-and-mortar pharmacy and you purchase a drug, you're getting a safe and effective drug. I have confidence in the Canadian drug regulatory system. The, the places where we have deep concerns is when people go online and buy, buy drugs from uh, online pharmacies that are purporting to source their drugs in Canada or other first world uh, markets, but are not. And we have a lot of concerns, and we're seeing a lot of um, counterfeit drugs being sold through those channels. We have a lot of ongoing uh, investigative activity uh, and some uh, fairly egregious things that we're finding when we look at these websites. And so we have deep public health concerns. With respect to the work group, um, the work continues to go forward. That was designed to specifically address a more narrow circumstance of a situation where there's a big price increase that creates an access dislocation. Um, so certain situations um, of hardship that patients might face. I'm out of time, but I'd love to continue the discussion with you. you. Thank you very much. Ms. Lee. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. This is my first hearing, and I'm excited to be on this committee. I get a chance, actually, uh, Commissioner, to drill down on two of my favorite subjects, Cuba and cannabis. I co-chair <laughs> the bipartisan Cuba Working Group and the bipartisan Cannabis Caucus. A couple of issues that I want to raise with you uh, about those two issues. One is, you know, 30 million Americans, uh, about 9.4 percent of the population have, has diabetes. For African Americans, those numbers are even worse. African Americans are 80 percent more likely to get diabetes than their white counterparts. And currently, 13 percent of African Americans have diabetes. Now, as I mentioned in our meeting, uh, Cuba currently has a diabetes drug called Heberpop. It's helped and prevented deep foot ulcers, and it's not just being used in Cuba, but in 20 countries around the world, it 
does prevent amputations. 71,000 Cuban patients have been treated, and overall 300,000 patients worldwide have been treated. Now, it's my understanding that as of March last year, uh, Cuban and U.S. companies came together and signed an agreement to begin to uh, look at how to move forward with clinical trials and getting approved. They're still waiting, though, approval by FDA. And so I'm wondering if you could give us a status report of this approval process. I've been working on this for 10, 12 years for this drug. And do you think we'll see the approval uh, for this in the United States? Because this is a very, very serious issue for everyone, uh, especially in minority communities in terms of diabetes uh, amputations. Secondly, just on terms of cannabis, uh, it's my understanding to date that FDA has on approved only one plant-derived medicine from cannabis and that it was awarded, quite frankly, to the British pharmaceutical company, GW Pharmaceutical, because they are licensed by the UK government to privately grow strains of cannabis for the purpose of drug development. Many members of Congress uh, support medical can cannabis research to facilitate federally approved clinical trials. And so it's, bet it's really important to understand cannabis therapeutic applications and its impact on health and well-being. So I'm wondering um, if you believe uh, it's possible that under our U.S. federal system, whereby cannabis is, is still on Schedule One substance, uh, can a U.S.-based company similarly bring a plant-derived cannabis-based drug to market via the traditional FDA re review and approval process? Because so many states now have passed medical uh, marijuana uh, initiatives, and it's, it's a shame that we haven't been able to move forward with the research. Well, on the, on the first question, Congressman, I appreciate our discussion about this um, when we met. Uh, we owe you an answer, and I, I want to be careful because I'm not sure which aspects of, of where they are in the application process constitutes commercial confidential information that I shouldn't reveal in, a, in, a, um, in this setting, but I will get back to you um, one way or the other on what we can tell you about where that, where that process stands, and I, I look forward to following up with your office. Okay, I appreciate that, because it's been going on a long time. A lot of people are waiting for this. I understand. We will, I'll make sure we get you as much information as we can about that, and I, I recognize and appreciate your interest in that matter. With respect to um, um, hemp-derived um, or, or, or cannabis-derived compounds, it really depends on which active ingredient you're talking about, whether you're talking about THC or CBD, and whether or not it's being derived from marijuana or hemp. Um, I think one of the active questions on the table is whether or not CBD, so GW Pharma was marketing a product that was a purified form of CBD derived from marijuana, if I remember correctly in that case, um, but the, question, the active question on the table right now is whether or not CBD derived from hemp, which Congress made a decision to deschedule hemp, whether or not the CBD derived from that is also descheduled and can be studied uh, in a more fluid fashion. And I think that that is an active question right now on the table. I have my own personal opinion reading the plain language of the statute, but if I give a legal opinion, my, uh, my lawyers are going to grimace at me, so I won't offer it. Um, but I think we're going to have a resolution on that very soon about whether or not the CBD derived from hemp um, doesn't fall under the scheduling yeah. process. Okay. Th thank you very much, but I want to clarify this British pharmaceutical company, GW Pharmaceuticals, and that they're licensed by the UK government to privately grow strains of cannabis for the purpose of research. Why did FDA award this contract to this British company, or it, it, could no, you clarify so, that? I mean, so so it is the case in the United States that the ability to conduct research with um, with with marijuana um, is uh, more restricted, more heavily regulated. You have to use product that is sourced um, from the government. I don't know all the nuance of it. Um, so, you know, over the years you have seen, in all candor, you have seen companies go overseas to conduct research with foreign grown product that is more easily sourced for the purposes of clinical trials. And so the, I think the issue you're getting at um, is is a valid one. Um, the only thing I could say is that the environment here is changing quickly, and very we quickly. would certainly support more research. Okay. Th thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. DeLauro. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Dr. Gottlieb. It's a 
pleasure to be with you today. Just a couple of points, and then I have uh, two questions. With regard to the issues of prescription drugs, which was uh, mentioned, and the issue on generics, I just make you aware, and I'm sure you may be aware, with the, ne the renegotiated NAFTA agreement, uh, the way it's currently constructed would delay generics and bio uh, similars, given the way the uh, a patent exclusivity has uh, currently been awarded to pharmaceutical companies. So just take a look at it because it directly affects uh, where I think you want to go. With regard to food safety, according to the Center for Disease Control uh, and Prevention, studied imported food safety, both uh, the number and proportion of outbreaks from imported food has increased since 1996. Outbreaks associated with imported produce and fish uh, were uh, the, 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 the most common. My two questions have to do with uh, both, one is food safety, and then it's the safety of uh, imported uh, pharmaceutical drugs. Um, uh, last year, FDA investigated the outbreak, multi-state outbreak of E. coli uh, infections that were linked to romaine lettuce from the Yuma growing region. Total reported illnesses, 210 people across 36 states, 96 hospitalizations, five deaths. The outbreak highlighted the devastating effects of FDA's inadequate oversight of food safety, particularly among fresh, pr fresh produce. The investigation um, uh, with regard to that, the agency did not conduct sampling for the environmental assessment until June 2018, more than two months after the outbreak started. The, it, it confirmed that the outbreak strain was positively identified in an irrigation canal used by many growers in the region. It was located next to this irrigation canal as a large cattle feedlot operation. Significant because E. coli is naturally found in the intestinal tracts and manure of cattle. Um, uh, in, in fact, FDA sampling at the feedlot found multiple positive samples of dangerous E. coli strains, though not an exact match uh, to the outbreak uh, strain. At, uh, Noted in FDA's written environmental assessment, the sampling conducted at the feedlot was, quote, limited and is, quote, not possible to draw valid conclusions. Curious to know why FDA did not conduct additional sampling at the feedlot operation, especially given its proximity to the irrigation canal and the fact that cattle are carriers of E. coli. In your opinion, as a matter of public health, should large feedlot operations like that in Yuma be located near irrigation canals and fields growing fresh produce? Given all these findings, why is FDA still pursuing its delay of the agriculture water testing requirements under the proto safety rule? Well, I, 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 there's a lot that we can have a discussion around on these issues, and I know my time is brief. Um, look, the, we have gotten a lot better when it comes to these post-outbreak investigations. And if you look at what, what we were able to do with respect to romaine lettuce in California, we were able to make much, much more rapid determinations about what the potential source was um, of that outbreak. Um, so I think we, we are getting better and continue to get better. The resources that this committee provided is going to go specifically, at least in part, to building out the teams that do these post-outbreak investigations, because this is a very important part um, of our overall approach to food safety and, and public health. Um, with respect to the CAFO and its proximity to the irrigation canal, there have to be measures put in place to make sure that there isn't direct proximity that can lead to the kinds of contaminations that you talked about. There are rules in place. They need to be re-examined in terms of what measures farmers are taking. And with respect to the agricultural water rule, um, you know, we have implemented most of the major parts of FSMA. The ones that we have either delayed or still have to implement are the ones that are really hard. And this one's really hard, trying to get in place agricultural water standards that aren't only rigorous and going to provide the measure of safety that, that you expect and want and that I want for the American people, um, but that can be actually implemented across a very diverse array of farmers where, you know, if you look in the Pacific Northwest, they trade water on a daily basis. And we have to make sure our testing requirements accommodate much different practices with respect to where farmers get their water in different parts of this country. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope we'll move to on, on these issues and take a look at um, where we go with uh, de dealing with feedlots. I've got about 27 seconds left, but the issue is safety of imported pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, largest prescription drug recalls in re recent history, 
class of blood pressure medications manufactured in China, found to be contaminated with impurities that cause cancer. Uh, the bigger issue, outsourcing pharmaceutical manufacturing to countries like China. They don't have the same level of consumer protection and safety laws of those in this country. Uh, long been concerned about FDA's oversight of foreign drug manufacturers. Uh, GAO released their findings on the issue um, and found that with, despite the foreign offices that have been opened, FDA has not assessed these offices' contributions to drug safety. Nearly half of their authorized positions are unfilled. GAO made recommendations. I won't go through that. I'm sure you know what it is. Um, foreign offices. Are they, why are not they being utilized as they can and for the safety of pharmaceuticals coming into the United States? Uh, are we on track to meet previous targets of inspections of foreign drug facilities? My time has run out, but I think that these are important issues. I'm May suspect I take 15 that I can't. Seconds, Mr. Chairman? Um, foreign inspections have, have gone up, uh, Congresswoman, in recent years. Um, the number of warning letters that we issued have gone up substantially as a result of us targeting our inspections better. They'll continue to go up. The other thing I would um, add is that we will be undertaking the first significant modernization of our GMP standards with, with respect to active pharmaceutical ingredients, particularly with respect to generic firms, um, in probably over 20 years. I share your concerns. I have confidence in the manufacturing of generic drugs, but we can always be doing a better job. If you can just get back to me on the pursuit of this, the, this largest prescription drug recall in recent history and where Absolutely. we're going on. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Gottlieb. Uh, let me just ask you about uh, third-party logistics. Uh, as you know, the Drug Supply Chain Security Act of 2013 was enacted to protect patient safety and ensure the security of the drug supply chain through a single national uniform product serializing and traceability system. Uh, despite the passage of federal legislation in 2013 that would provide third-party logistics companies with the preemption from state licensing requirements, uh, FDA's failure to write implementing regulation has resulted in states trying to fill the void by introducing new licensing regulations. Uh, the Drug Supply Chain Security Act required the FDA to issue final regulations for the licensing of third-party logistics providers and wholesale distributors by November 2015. However, as of today, not even the proposed licensure standards have been issued. Uh, where is the rulemaking package related to licensure? When can we expect to see the proposed licensure standards? And don't we need to have some uniformity in licenses to secure and to keep the supply chain moving? Um, that that <coughs> rule is moving through the through the agency and through the process. Um, I can get back to you with an exact target date on when it, and when it will be displayed. Uh, I've been briefed on it recently. Um, it was crafted in a way that's going to provide for um, uniformity across the country and a federal preemption standard. Uh, I wanted to go back to a subject that you and I have uh, frequently discussed, and that's e-cigarettes. On uh, the comprehensive plan for tobacco and nicotine regulation that you announced July 2017, the deadline for non-combustible uh, e-cigarette market applications was moved to 2022. That was 19 months ago. Uh, I continue to be concerned about how smaller companies uh, that make these products are going to be able to afford the cost of the required applications. Uh, I fear that they're going to have to go out of business unless we find a way to address this. Uh, if we don't, we'll have a smaller market controlled by big companies with fewer choices for adult smokers, higher prices, and probably less innovation. If adult smokers who wish to use e-cigarettes to reduce or end their use of combustible uh, combustibles cannot find the products that they like, they may not make that change and the public health will suffer. What have you done to address the costs that may devastate the smaller companies in this industry and what do you plan to do going forward? Well, we're cognizant of this concern, uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, and, and in part, you know, our desire to extend the application deadlines on these products and give them till 2022 was to give us the time to put in place the implementing regulations and guidance that would not only provide the rules of the road for how to um, effectively traverse the PMTA process, um, but also take into consideration the kinds of challenges that you bring up about how we can build into our regulation and guidance accommodations for small manufacturers. Um, we've tried to do that in other areas of tobacco regulation. We will try to do that uh, in this context as well. Thank you. Uh, AccuAdvantage Salmon was approved by FDA 
in November 2015 after an exhaustive and rigorous review. Uh, despite FDA approval, the company is still not able to market its salmon in the United States. As you know, our bill over the past few years has carried language from the Senate that prohibits market introduction of genetically engineered salmon until FDA issues final labeling guidelines, quote, for informing consumers of such content, end quote. Uh, your website says FDA has determined that no additional labeling of food from AccuAdvantage salmon is required. Am I correct in believing that as the law stands now, FDA will not do what the Senate language asks it to do, and therefore the product will continue to be barred from entering the United States? This is a very active area of discussion inside the agency right now. We hope to um, have something to say on this very shortly, um, hopefully within a matter of weeks, not months. Um, but we're working through the question of whether or not the final rule that USDA put out in, in, in conjunction with the 2016 law, um, where they are now assuming jurisdiction over labeling of these products, um, what that does to the, uh, the language that's in our appropriations rider and what, what if any, um, continued jurisdiction or obligations FDA has in this regard. Thank you very much. Uh, let me call on my colleague, Mr. Fortenberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to go back to the discussion that uh, Ms. DeLauro had raised regarding imported food. You said 13 percent of our consumption, as I recall, you said is, fr is imported. 15. 15. How much of that comes from China? And you may recall uh, some years back the head of China's Food and Drug Administration was executed because of tainted pet food. Now, if you make an error, we're not going to do that. But <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, I understand we have about 50, at most 50 inspectors worldwide for food and drugs. And then how much of our food comes from China? How many inspectors do we have? Um, we, we don't have inspectors that are just dedicated to foreign inspections versus domestic inspections. We do have a, a, a foreign inspectional cadre, but we do use dom inspectors across both domestic and foreign inspections. We conduct about 1,600 foreign inspections a year um, of facilities, about, as I said, 15 percent of the food that we eat is imported. I don't have an overall number of what a percentage of food comes in from China offhand. I can get back to you on that. But I think the what you will see is that it's going to vary by food products. So, for example, a high percentage of fish might be imported from China. Other products, a high percentage might be imported from other regions of the world. Um, we put out this week uh, a framework for how we intend to try to improve our overall oversight of foreign inspection of food products. I recognize this is an area of concern for Congress. It's an area of concern for me, as the percentage of the food that we um, eat, consume, um, grows as a from uh, from imports. Um, I have confidence in the system right now, but but I, I that's only because we continue to invest in this, and I believe that we're going to continue to do a good job um, by modernizing these approaches. So, how many inspectors do we have in China, or? elaborate on the framework of inspection in, in China. How does it, how does yeah, it I'd work? I'd have to get back to that. We have a dedicated office in China that I think um, has allocated to a 26 FTEs. I believe that there's six FTEs there right now and six more that are in the process of being onboarded. But that's not really the operative um, number of people because inspectors that we would use to do Chinese inspections um, would be domestic inspectors that would be based here and going over to do foreign inspections. What, what I could tell you is the number of inspections that we can conduct we conduct by country. That might give you um, an indication as opposed to FTE levels allocated to country. But we can get back to you with all that data. I just don't have it offhand. Yeah, I'm assuming FTEs means outcomes. If there's some other metric that determines safety levels, that would be helpful to know. Number of inspections Obviously, by region it, it's relative a variable, to imports. But, yeah. uh, so, yes, help us understand. But I, is I, it robust enough? I, that's my concern. Uh, I understand. Concern. I would just, uh, if I may, um, I would just say that I, the metric that I would, I wouldn't use the metric of inspections by region or inspections by percentage of imports coming from an area because so much of our foreign um, oversight is contingent upon shared um, oversight with foreign regulators third-party audits, um, 
requirements we impose on importers, and so it's a multi-layered system. So, for example, we, we rely on regula reg regulators in New Zealand, Canada, and Australia. We have joint, joint agreements with them, and we're negotiating one with the UK. So in those countries, we might conduct fewer inspections because we trust the Canadian regulators. We trust their inspections. Um, so it, it's going to depend by the region and what other tools we have. Do you trust in China's inspections? China currently isn't on a list of regulators whose inspections we recognize. No. No. All right. Thank you. Um, l let me go to two other quick questions. Um, it was touched on earlier, I believe, by Mr. Molinar. What is your plan to develop abuse deterrent formulations uh, to replace opioid, the current opioid? We continue to feel that this is an opportunity, um, both non-opioid alternatives for the treatment of pain as well as abuse deterrent formulations of opioids um, is an opportunity um, as, as one of the tools to address this crisis. We promulgated guidance um, just this last year on um, some of the standards for developing generic versions of abuse deterrent formulations. We are working through a process to re-adjudicate the nomenclature that we use to describe the, the abuse deterrent formulations. So we're trying to get in place a robust regulatory framework to allow these products to go forward. Um, you know, one of the conditions that we would consider if we were to sweep the market of a non-abuse deterrent formulation um, to allow just abuse deterrent formulations within a category of drugs is could you have the availability of generic versions of that drug? And that's why the guidance on allowing generic versions of the ADF drugs to come forward was so important. It opens the door to our ability to convert the market to ADFs. So that, that would replace the immediate release? Opioid. Well, you know, um, the abuse to turn formulations that have been put into develop, to my knowledge right now, are the extended release long acting formulations. But there are early development um, with some abuse to turn formulations of the immediate release drugs. And you're right in pointing that out because 90%, more than 90% of the utilization is the IR drugs. That's where the exposure is happening. Okay. Oh. Okay. Mr. Cuellar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner, on the uh, question that I asked you about the oxycontin uh, and the work that y'all want to do about possible uh, relabeling, and then on the compound pharmacist uh, efficiency work that y'all want to do, what's the timetable on each of them, just so we can get an idea? What, what are you talking about? So Months, on, years, decades? So on the um, on the guidance that I believe will help to find a more efficient pathway for 503A compounders to convert to being 503B compounders days to weeks. Okay. Um, with respect to the studies, um, the, long, the studies to look at the implications of the long-term use of opioids and whether or not there's diminished effectiveness with chronic administrations of opioids, um, that, that will be a multi-year process. I think that those studies, once we put the mandate on the companies, which we're going to do in the next several months, I think those studies can potentially be conducted within a year, and then you're looking at potentially another year to read out the results. And so it's a multi-year process. We have to, as much as it seems intuitive that there's declining efficacy with prolonged administration of opioids, um, and there is some evidence in the literature to suggest that, there is an evidence that meets the statutory standard that we're required to meet in order to um, affect regulatory change. We need to conduct rigorous, prospective, randomized tr trials. These are going to be randomized withdrawal studies. Um, and so those do take time to conduct, but they can form the basis of enduring, enduring regulatory change, which is what I think we need in this space. Okay. Uh, I sit on the uh, defense probe, so uh, I have a question dealing with that uh, and your agency. Uh, last November, the FDA announced the approval of another opioid, um, the Sylvia, the Sylvia yeah. a drug that's 10 times more powerful than fentanyl. Uh, Commissioner, you admitted to the potential dangers of this drug, uh, but have said that the Sylvia could be beneficial for the military in use in the battlefield situations because the drug can be administered under the, the tongue. You've stated that it, quote, fills a specific and important but limited unmet medical need in treating our nation's soldiers on the battlefield. Uh, my question, Commissioner, is has the military given you a requirement for this type of drug? Uh, have you talked to the military about the need for this potent of a drug on the battlefield? Uh, and you said that the main benefit will be to the military, but how do you intend to limit the drugs used to solely military battlefield environments? And, and again, I don't want to see it with all due respect, the 2001 situation again. I understand. And so let me just um, give a little bit of a table set, if I may, and I'll be quick here. Um, it's a very potent formulation of fentanyl 
but it's a very small um, piece of the drug. So it's actually the equivalent of 15 milligrams of morphine, which is not a trivial dose of morphine, but it's not an extremely large dose of morphine. If I have a patient coming with a kidney stone, I would routinely use 15 milligrams grams of morphine. The reason why you need to use a very super potent formulation um, of the drug in order to deliver 15 milligrams of morphine, which is really a standard dose of analgesia for like a bedside surgical procedure, is because you want it to be absorbed quickly. If you were using something that wasn't potent, it might be, the, might be this big, and it's not going to be absorbed under the tongue. So you had to use a very potent formulation of fentanyl in order to allow sublingual delivery of that drug. Um, with respect to the, the um, DOD in particular, we made a commitment to Congress as part of the NDAA that was passed last year um, that we would prioritize um, drugs and medical products that were important to the frontline soldiers and to the DOD and give them breakthrough-like status and breakthrough-like touch from the FDA. Desuvia was on the list of products that the DOD prioritized. That list was about 10 products. And so this was important to the DOD, at least as they ident identified it, it to us. And so we did work collaboratively with them around this product. So they, they did give you a requirement for this type of drug? Not a requirement, but they did flag this as something that was a priority of theirs on the priority list that they gave us of around, if I remember correctly, around 10 products. So how do we make sure that this stays on the battlefield? Because, I mean, you have soldiers, they become veterans, they might need some yeah. help afterwards, and we, I, I just, you know, without due respect, I don't want to see a 2001 situation. I understand, and I will tell you that this is, Desuvia is going to be, as, as it's used in hospital settings, and it does play a role there, too. If you're, if you're a doctor and you need to do a bedside surgical procedure, and I've been there where I had to put in chest tubes and couldn't get a line in the patient and couldn't give them any analgesic, and that's not a comfortable position to be in. This can be a useful product for that niche kind of circumstance. This is a product that will be dispensed in hospitals under tight controls. It will be probably secured in PICSIS systems. That doesn't mean that there isn't an opportunity for some diversion in hospitals. The kind of diversion you're talking about would typically be among healthcare providers. Unfortunately, we do see some abuse of drugs by anesthesiologists and other physicians and providers in the hospital setting. That goes on. Um, but there are much tighter controls on that kind of activity, and it doesn't go on as much as it used to. And I'm not saying it's not going to happen. When it comes to fentanyl, um, this is a challenge. But this is a challenge where perhaps dozens or maybe hundreds of people can, can potentially be exposed. And I'm not trying to trivialize that. The biggest challenge we face with fentanyl, quite frankly, is the illicit fentanyl that's pouring across the international mail facilities. And God knows where else, but we're, don't, don't say we're looking at the IMF. Border, we know yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking about the international mail facilities where I have jurisdiction. That's where I'm also focused, Congressman. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Harris. Thank you very much. Uh, just a, uh, one follow-up on the fiber question I had. Do you, how many dietary fiber uh, petitions do you currently uh, have in review, and, and what's the timeline for that response? Again, uh, and will you respond by, uh, regula by rulemaking, or are you going to be communicating directly with the petition? Um, I believe we have three to five petitions currently in-house, and we'll be communicating directly with the petitioners. Um, you know, we're doing what we can to try to get as many people over the line as possible, and that's, that's been our goal from the outset. Okay, and good. And again, because, you know, I know that our food manufacturers really want to comply with that, that January 1st deadline. <coughs> with regards to recall standardization, um, the USDA has standardized its food recall communications, particularly with respect to disclosure of retailers, and that streamlined approach has been pretty effective at disseminating consistent, accurate retailer information to consumers. Uh, it would probably be, I think it might be helpful for the FDA to take the same approach. Is there an initiative to do that? And uh, you know, you're also considering, uh, you know, online submissions process like Canada has that would, uh, uh, would uh, uh, negate the differences that you see now between what different FDA regional offices are requiring. When I look at food safety, Congressman, I look at it from the perspective of the consumer, what the consumer wants. They want timely recalls and adequate information and able to know whether or not they have a violated product. They want effective track and trace so they can know where their products are coming from, and they want the assurance of safety that we provide through things like the inspections. We've taken steps in recent years to try to make our re uh, recall process more robust, including providing um, information about um, where a product may have come from if you went to a local store and, and a recall product was purchased in that local store. Um, highlighting the stores where products may have been sold. We're going to continue to try to modernize that product because I think this is one of the, the core pillars of what consumers want when they think about food safety. Sure. And, and uh, again, uh, uh, 
Do you think it would make sense to, to unify the process between the FDA regional, pro, regional offices? I mean, to uniform, so it's a uniform requirement? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware that it's not, and I can get back to you on that in terms of specifically what concerns you may have about where there may be discrepancies about what we do from region to region, because we do try to have, um, you know, um, nationalized standards in place to, to these kinds of core elements of our food safety approach. Sure. No, thank you. I appreciate you getting back to me on that. Finally, uh, one issue that's come up is the, uh, and, uh, and I know this is an issue personally in the family, because I'm I, oldest daughter is expecting my eighth grandchild. Uh, and I just talked to her yesterday, uh, two days ago, actually, about fish consumption and uh, the, how the, the uh, potential benefits of fish consumption, uh, both on neurologic development and now late, the latest uh, on uh, basically resulting in children, you know, increasing uh, uh, fish consumption, especially after 24 weeks, resulting in an increased uh, body weight, but lean body weight at, uh, you know, as, as a child. Uh, has the FDA calculated, uh, you know, updated benefits of fish consumption on fetal development, and why, why aren't, why isn't the FDA actively uh, encouraging uh, fish consumption for pregnant women, given the scientific evidence that it is actually as beneficial? Well, first of all, congratulations. Um, we do uh, actively encourage fish consumption, and we think fish is underconsumed by. Uh, um, by, by pregnant moms, expectant moms, and we have taken steps to try to encourage more fish consumption. And, and the um, changes we made to how we define what fish is safe to eat during pregnancy was intended and designed to try to promote more fish consumption. Um, this continues to be a goal of the agency. And, and on your, for instance, on your website available to the public, I mean, does it, 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 does it mention the calculated benefits of, of fish consumption, or does it just glow and say, look, you know, eating some fish is good? I believe I mean, it does. We can get you the specific language that we use on the website, but I believe it does, and we have had campaigns in the past. I, I see your chief of staff shaking his head no, but we can, we can take a look at that, <laughs> and there may be more that we can be doing there, because this is a public health goal of ours. We share your concern. Absolutely. No, I thank you very much. And again, thank you for appearing before the subcommittee. Thank you. Uh, we are winding down, and I think our last uh, question, I'll recognize uh, Mr. Laurel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just to uh, respond to, uh, if I can, to my, my colleague, Mr. Fortenberry, first of all, 94 percent of our seafood is imported into the U.S. In terms of top imports from China, tilapia, 78 percent, cod, 51 percent, and might, might add to that that that's farmed. They farm their fish. Uh, there, and I don't have to describe what that process is about. I might also add that most of our shrimp comes from Malaysia or Thailand, and in fact, that's farmed as well. Uh, so I would just say to my colleague from Maryland, I would be wary of what kind of fish uh, my pregnant daughter uh, was eating and where it was coming from, know where it's coming from. Apple juice is 50 percent from China, mushrooms 34 percent, garlic is 31 uh, percent. Uh, this issue, at a longer discussion, gets into equivalency and what are the standards under which this regulatory framework, whether, uh, uh, yes, Australia, Canada, et cetera, but we do business with a whole lot of other countries who don't have the kind of regulatory framework we do, and that, I think, presents a problem uh, for food safety. Uh, another point, again, in terms of the safety of the imported pharmaceutical drugs, I, I, I just let me highlight that it's about the outsourcing of pharmaceutical manufacturing to countries, which is something I think we have to talk about, and that's like China. They don't have the same level of consumer protection and safety laws uh, as those of this country. It is estimated that as much as 80 percent of active ingredients in U.S. branded pharmaceuticals and over-the-counter drugs originate from either China or India. I think that's an area that we have to explore and to find out what, again, we've got food, we've got pharmaceuticals coming from places um, that have uh, potentially, I'll just say potentially, I believe it puts our, our people at, uh, at risk. Um, uh, I, I, too, uh, because we're all going down the vaping and these cigarette road, um, Dr. Gottlieb, um, I happen to believe that that's r r uh, uh, the growing epidemic of youth vaping uh, has reversed decades of progress that we made in reducing youth nicotine addiction. Um, 2019, the vaping industry is still exempt from any meaningful FDA oversight and regulation. Your tweet, December 2018, I'm writing CAOs of 
of CEOs of e-cigarette manufacturers, asking them to meet to discuss commitments they made last month and why some are changing course. This is an urgent matter. January 4, 2019, New York Times. Juul and Altria made very specific assertions in their letters and statements to the FDA about the drivers of, youth, uh, of the youth epidemic. Their recent actions and statements appear to be inconsistent with those commitments. Um, uh, uh, Altria, uh, 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 industry actions coupled with Altria re recently purchasing 35 percent stake in Juul demonstrate to you that the industry cannot be relied upon to take voluntary action to solve the epidemic. Why has the agency refused to implement mandatory rules with the industry must follow. Let me ask uh, uh, that, that question. Um, we also have deeply false and misleading and frankly illegal marketing advertising of e-cigarettes and vapor products. Family Smoking and Prevention and Tobacco Control Act prohibits health claims about reduced risk tobacco products where such claims are not scientifically proven or would cause net public harm. FDA uh, continues to allow this, uh, the e-cigarettes e e to make implicit, explicit, unauthorized, modified risk claims. FDA, as I understand it, you tell us, FDA has not granted such authorization for such modified risk claims, nor has the FDA approved any e-cigarette as a secession uh, device. You are on the website, Dr. Gottlieb, of, 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 of Jules' website. Um, it's called harm reduction. You're quoted. This is about, they talk about potential harm reduction, less risky products. And I, I, read it if you haven't read it. Uh, uh, so Altria uh, is quoting you on that promotional uh, web website. What about these, what about these, these, these claims that they're making? Why are we refusing to implement mandatory rules on this, on this industry? Well, Congresswoman, I share all your concerns. This is the, the, the biggest challenge I face right now um, that I don't feel we have all the policies in place to deal with it. The biggest public health crisis we face is clearly the opioid crisis. I feel like we have policies in place that allow us to try to address it within the scope of what we're capable of doing. With respect to these cigarettes, we still don't have those policies in place. We will. This is one of my highest priorities right now. I'm working through my own process within my own administration to get these rules and guidances out. I'm hoping they'll be out very soon. Watch their advertising, because in my state of Connecticut, on uh, 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 the radio ads are on about harm reduction in this region. There are billboards now going up, full-page ads in the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, New York Times uh, 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 from Juul. The advertising has got to be watched and very, very closely. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Thanks, Chairman, for your, the, the time. Appreciate it. All right. Well, I think this has been, this has been a very, very Good hearing. exhaustive hearing. <laughs> I appreciate uh, your patience, Dr. Gottlieb. Uh, you've been very helpful and forthcoming. Uh, and if uh, any members would like to submit anything for the record uh, or would like to submit questions uh, to Dr. Gottlieb that uh, he can get back with us, please uh, feel free to do so. Uh, with that, we will uh, adjourn this hearing of the Agriculture, Food and Drug Administration, Rural Development Subcommittee for Appropriations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.